Hi and welcome to this third short tutorial. Thanks for all your comments and questions so far. Keep them coming and I'll try to get to them all in due course. I've had a question from Sumia Dipta Ray, and I hope that's the right way to pronounce it. And he's asked, what is the best guitar that you can buy for $1,500? Now this is a really tricky question because as you'll see when you watch the video, that guitars of the same make and model can vary so much. So it's really important to know how to check things like tap tone, body resonance, um, intonation, action. And by the end of this video, you should have a pretty good idea of how to do these things. If you're just about to buy a new guitar, watch this film and you really could make some big savings. Buying a new instrument can be a bit of a minefield. So by the time you've seen this, you should have a better idea of what to look for and what to listen to. We're going to go and meet one of the top dealers, Miles Roberts from Kent Guitar Classics, and he's going to advise us on choosing a new instrument. In past YouTube videos, I've tended to concentrate on the top range guitars like Hauser's and Romanillos, because not many of us can afford those. I know I can't. Um, so a lot of you have written to me and asked me to do a video on the more affordable range. So in this film, we're going to concentrate on beginner and student models. Making this video did present me with a little bit of a dilemma in that Miles didn't want this just to be an advert for the guitars that we featured. But I know that you would all ask me what those instruments were. So I have put what they are with Miles's permission, um, apart from the bad instrument that we use. Um, so the important thing is not what the instruments are, because I'm sure other makes are good as well. But the important thing is to use these principles of uh, testing them that we're going to talk about. And I would recommend that you listen to the demonstrations of the guitar with headphones or good speakers so that you can really hear what Miles is talking about. I hope you get something out of this video. Please share your experiences of student and beginner model guitars in the comments section below. And uh, don't forget to give me a thumbs up if you enjoy it and subscribe. That way you won't miss any more of these short tutorials. Um, in this discussion today, you wanted to talk about selecting student guitars particularly. Um, even so, there is a huge selection for potential buyers. Uh, we'll ignore the very cheap instruments uh, badly made that one can buy from household stores like Argos and so forth. Uh, but nevertheless, um, the first price range of student guitars is I, what I would say is, is up to the £400 guitar. Uh, these will be factory made and these days largely made in the Far East or partly made in the Far East, sometimes despite what it says on the label. Um, and then you have from something like £500 to about £1,500, you have guitars which are at the uh, better end of the mass-made factory guitars, or you have workshop guitars where in places like Valencia you may have a workshop of six or eight people. Uh, producing a limited number of models, four or five classicals, four or five flamencos perhaps. Um, obviously still not the work of an individual artisan, um, but uh, offering a bit more refinement and quality than some of the lower priced factory guitars. Uh, beyond that, uh, life can get a little bit more difficult. Uh, you can um, e easily pay in the price range two to three thousand uh, pounds you can still be buying guitars which are not the work of an individual artisan maybe uh, still not totally handmade commonly varnish finished or 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 lacquer finished um, um, and they are they can be really very variable to get into having a, a handmade instrument of higher quality, which is not going to be the main burden of our discussion today, commonly you need to be spending something over three and a half thousand pounds, typically. There are always some exceptions, and we can't, in this conversation, really take too much account of the second-hand market, because you know that's just very difficult to be uh, descriptive about. Um, 
It's still nevertheless a bit of a minefield and in any price bracket there are many brands and makes, some of which if your priority is sound quality and playability, some of which can be really remarkably good and others can be really rather disappointing. And um, in that way it's understandable that a lot of people really need some guidance about well how do I find my way through this through this minefield. Now also bearing in mind that guitars uh, being wooden instruments and, and wood not being as if you like consistent as, as, as a metal for, say, for sake of argument um, you could have half a dozen guitars of the same make and the same model and there can be some variability. So why, why is that? Is that because of the grain or? Yes, it can be because of the wood quality itself or the way that it's been selected. Um, in a factory environment, um, you know, the, the numbers that are being produced are such that not everyone will be put together necessarily in the same way by the same people. Um, and even in the world of the high level uh, handcraft, artisan makers there is a degree of variability. Uh, well, a large you, degree, isn't there? There's, it is a large degree. You could take two or three pieces of wood off the same chunk off the same tree and acoustically they can behave quite differently one to the other. So it's not like buying a car where you know exactly what you're getting. You, no. need, to, you need to know what to look for. You do, you do, that's right. So um, it is quite surprising, I find, that uh, some of the better selected uh, low price guitars these days really can be surprisingly good. Um, I mean, some of, some of these sort of instruments, which are in the sort of the £300 territory, can really have a big, warm, long sustaining sound. Uh, th which fools a lot of people into thinking that their price is actually three or four times what they really are. But is it possible that you could get yourself a £300 guitar like that and it actually sounds better than a £1,000 guitar? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, disappointingly, and, and, and we're not going to mention, mention makes or brands here, um, but uh, some of these which I've picked out as being, to my opinion, uh, some of the more pleasing at their modest price, I find much more musical and better than many instruments that are four times the price, which might look more fancy and more decorated, but they just don't have the sound. Just play a few uh, chords on that one again and let's have a listen. Good. And this is one of the um, um, low price models which have got a mahogany or sapele back and sides, which most guitars these days below about £350, £400, that's probably what they will have. Uh, you have to pay a bit more to get into tropical hardwoods, um, rosewoods for example. But, you know, I just think they're surprisingly good. Um, one of the things uh, which I personally think makes a big difference uh, is about where the natural resonances of instruments lie. Um, we, we've, we speak from time to time about the tap tones of the back and the top of the guitar and also about the air resonance of the of the of the guitar body and personally I think this is really quite important and really quite telling 
So if this is maybe one of the first things you need to try when you. Uh, yes, because I personally think that it that it says a lot about the fundamental character of the instrument. Okay. Now I hasten to add that this is something that I think is really quite important and some people think is less important and, and you know so we're into the realms of, of personal opinion and personal experience. Um, but for example if you take if you take many instruments which I find somewhat disappointing so for example this one if you if you blank the strings or just stop the strings vibrating with your left hand and just with a tambour on the strings above the bridge I can hear in that uh, a tap tone which is not far off A, which in fact it's, it's between A and B flat. Now what that does is check the response of the top of the guitar. Mm -hmm. Now that is really quite high pitched. Just do that once more because uh, just to, if, if you just play the note first and then tap it and then we can hear how it's similar. It's above A, it's getting close to B flat actually. It's, it's halfway between A and B flat. Um, now other instruments uh, have a much lower pitch, so taking even this modest price one, you can hear it's a very much lower pitch, that's much more around, around G. Okay. Um, now. Do, do, do some guitars go even lower than that? Oh yes, yes they do. Um, if you go back to the very old instruments, going back to the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s of Torres in Spain, those guitars in those days were quite light, they were flexible, some of their tops were really quite thin, and some of those things contributed to them having a much lower natural resonance um, and similarly when you go beyond that into the early part of the 20th century with people like Enrique Garcia with Simplicio with Santos Hernandez uh, they also were relatively speaking quite deep sounding instruments. So this is a, a pretty special guitar but I wanted to demonstrate the um, the low this is a body res resonance of what around E or F or something? Yeah between E and F. Yeah, century sort of fashion wasn't it? Yeah, 1924 Santos and get into the late 1950s or possibly more importantly the mid 1960s guitars particularly from Madrid tended to get heavier at that time and partly because of heavier fan strut systems with additional additional bracing underneath the top uh, they had certain beneficial characteristics but one of the things that it did do was make the guitar heavier and somewhat more stiff and those things drive upwards the resonant pitch of the body okay. and that tends to make them more bright and not have the same kind of depth at, at the base end. Now whilst we uh, check the tap tones at the top, so if I come back to this one which is on A um, if you, with your head not blocking the sound hole, if you hum into it, starting off around A, that is a pitch, which on this one is about G sharp, which activates the whole of the body and makes it vibrate. Okay. And that's what we call the primary air resonance. And usually, I find this on 99% of the time on fan strutted guitars, there is a semitone difference between the tap tone and the air resonance. It's actually a semitone plus an octave, but that's by the way. Um, so, 
when you have a guitar with a high tap tone and a high air resonance, it tends to make the guitar treble very bright, often metallic, and to my personal taste, really too thin. And the bass sort of wiry and lacking depth. And on a guitar with a lower resonance, there is a warmer, sweeter sound in there, I feel, and in the bass. It's a fuller, richer, warmer sound, which I personally find much more pleasing than the thin and tinny sound. And this is just to remind everyone, just a 300 pound guitar. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yes. Now we are in the realms of personal taste here. Yeah. Uh, you can find some really quite expensive uh, special rare guitars which some people are very enthusiastic about which can have very very high pitches uh, and um, in, in my case I find that I, I'm not so enthusiastic about them. And is it also the case that if you've got the lower resonance sometimes it's difficult to have a nice treble as well so it's quite a difficult thing to balance up the two? It is, yes. Uh, it depends, of course, on the maker's skill and, and knowledge. Um, if you Sometimes the maker, in the, in the interest of trying to get a rich bass, shifts the whole balance of the instrument. And you can end up with a deep bass, but you lose the quality of the treble. But for the, the purposes of our first-time buyers or second or third-time buyers, yes. you think maybe just look for a slightly lower resonance around the G or F sharp? Yes, if you like uh, that, that warmer, richer sound. I mean, to me, with the classical guitar, we don't have the range of sounds of, for example, the piano, which has got those tremendously deep, low octave basses and very, very high trembles. We haven't got that range. Um, and I find in guitars that are quite high-pitched, you almost further compress the range. Whereas guitars which have got a lower resonance, the difference in character between the deepest basses and the highest treble, to me, is more opened out. And it just makes it more interesting. The other thing which um, uh, was one of the reasons that Julian Bream liked lower pitched instruments was because uh, when you're on the stage and you are sending sound to the audience, the bass sounds tend to lose more in their travel to someone sitting on the 10th row than the treble does. So he always felt that he wanted something that had an extra bassy sound on the stage. So by the time the sound reached the audience, it was more in balance. Mm. If you start off with a guitar which is fairly bright and missing some depth, when you hear it from a distance, you tend to hear just a rather tinny, okay. wiry sound. Yeah, I've not considered that before, because I, I play through a PA quite a bit, and uh, yeah. I know for a fact that the bass in that doesn't carry as far as the treble either. Right, so, interesting. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought yeah, about that. that's interesting. So that is why some guitars carry better in halls than others? Uh, one of the reasons. One of the reasons. One of the, that's a, it's a complex subject. The whole balance between projection and volume, loudness, if you like, is quite a complicated subject and brings about a lot of differing opinions from a lot of really quite knowledgeable people. In the lowest price range, normally the backs and sides, as I say, will not be uh, a tropical hardwood, they won't be rosewood. And in this case, as is very common, it's a sapele or mahogany. Um, when you go up a bit to the sort of 450, £500 mark, uh, you do uh, get into guitars uh, which will have rosewood back and sides. And commonly, though not always, they just have a little bit more, a bit more refinement and a bit more substance in the sound. Um, 
melody at the bass end maybe <laughs> This is this is rosewood, and this is this is mahogany. Okay. So now, a thing to remember is that a thousand pound guitar is not twice as good as a five hundred pound guitar. It just doesn't work like that. And a five thousand pound guitar is not twice as good as a two and a half thousand pound guitar. It's very much about the law of diminishing returns. That's a logarithmic scale, then. In a way, it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, I do think that. Um, when you go above currently, here we are in 2019, uh, when you go above the three, four hundred pound mark and you get into guitars that have got, for example, rosewood back and sides, you are going into the next category of sound quality. Okay. And I do believe... <laughs> believe you should be able to hear that in, in that guitar. Now when you go from uh, you know the, the 500 pound to the 700 pound guitar um, you should get a bit more. It will only be a bit more uh, and in this case I think by comparison with these two models of the same maker, this one being something like £200 more than this one, there is something more in this sound. Is it enormous? No, but there's something there. The other thing which I think everybody should remember, and this is actually a big pitfall, is that um, it's all about selecting the brand and selecting the instrument you will find many guitars in the marketplace that are twice the price of these which most people would consider actually not as good yes you will find guitars at twice this price which many people will think yes yeah, so well actually i think that's a bit better so a lot of it is actually about how you how you pick the guitars out remembering that they all do vary a little when you go above something like the 700 800 pound guitar i personally think life gets a little bit more tricky um, and very commonly you can come across guitars at 1200 1500 pounds which are not necessarily any better you are in the realms of course of personal preference mm -hmm. um, but it, it's an area where very often if you if you go to somewhere where instruments have been carefully selected or if you can do it yourself y you can be surprised what quality you can get at a lower price and people do need to have confidence in their own eyes and ears too often i feel sadly people are all the time reaching for you know big label names and the truth is that in terms of sound quality and playability that doesn't really guarantee you anything better you really need to and what sort of price range are you talking here um well there are the a big label name would surely be better than a 300 pound guitar no not always i've i've played many guitars in the 1500 to 2000 pounds territory which i thought were pretty awful actually yeah, one of the reasons and the common reason is because often they are just too stiff and heavy and you end up where their resonances are right up at B flat and, and I don't care who plays them, in that situation a guitar with a resonance up there is going to have a tinny treble and it's not going to have any kind of resonant bass. Now, yes we can say this is into personal preference but I would go as far as to say that if you have some of those guitars with the B-flat air resonance, I myself think it's a bad instrument. And uh, lots of people are welcome to disagree with me. But that's my experience. Okay. So could you um, give us some kind of method of checking out these guitars and, and, and looking for all these things that you just spoke about? Yeah. Well there is a really quite a lot of things to look for I mean when I'm checking out a guitar uh, first of all I, I check for the physical things 
So um, the action height, for example, so because obviously that affects the playability, typically between the surface of the fret and the underneath of the string at the, on, on uh, the 12th fret, on the base side it should typically be about 4, maximum 4.2 millimetres, 3.8 would be nice. And on the treble side, surface of fret to underneath the string is more typically 3 millimetres. 3.2 is okay, 2.8 would be nice. And is action, because I've played a lot of guitars and I know it's a huge difference in how easy they are to play, and that, that should be a big factor, shouldn't it? Yes. Easy to play. Uh, yes. Is the action the only thing that affects that? No, it is, it is very important though. Um, what is perhaps a little more difficult for people to check is that the fingerboard on a guitar should not be absolutely level and straight. If it were, whenever you play on the bass strings, you'll end up with a lot of bass rattling because when you play one note, the string will start to catch on the fret above. So there's a certain amount of curvature. Oh, really? Yeah. And th the way to do that normally is you, you, you sight down from the head and look towards the bridge and you should see just a gentle amount of curvature. There are one or two other things to check for, but uh, you know they're, they're, they're a bit more subtle and I think would take a bit too long to explain. So you're looking for that little bit of curvature? You're looking for just a little bit of, of even curvature. Otherwise, if you, if you play a guitar that's got a really flat neck and a comfortable treble, you'll find, I'm just going to make it do it, you'll get that slappy, slappy noise, which of course we really don't want. Um, the action height is um, something that is personal. So for example, someone that's only ever going to play really quite lightly can tolerate a lower action. Someone that plays a lot of rest stroke and plays strongly and doesn't s spend their time near the bridge uh, is going to need a higher action. So, and for that reason, the saddles are not glued in. They are designed to be taken out and trimmed down or replaced with a higher one according to the individual player's needs. At the nut, uh, that is uh, uh, should be set up properly and is not something that is normally adjusted for the player. But a quick way to check that um, is uh, if you, if for example, if you just press here, okay, you should find that there is just a little bit of clearance between the string and the first fret. If it's too, if there's a, a big gap you will find that playing in the first position, particularly with something like an F chord, is just going to be hard work. Uh, the other thing you can do to check that neck curvature is if you, if you just press the string here, you should find that you should be able to hear a clearance. There's a tapping noise. The, the string isn't resting on the frets. Oh, okay. So if it is, don't hear anything. If you don't hear, if you if it's if it's hard, you you hardly you hardly hear a noise when you do that. If it's straight. If it's too if it's too straight and too low, okay. and then you're probably going to be into trouble with buzzing. Okay. okay. Uh, intonation, of course, is is something that's very important, and again, uh, that's a complicated subject because it can depend on what strings are on the guitar. But I mean, the sort of fundamentals you can do is if you just play a, a pair of octaves G to G in first position, is it still in tune when you go to fifth position? Go to, go up here, does it stay in, and go right up to the top. That's pretty good. I find that the harmonic on the twelfth compared with the fretted notes Exactly, very important. Very important. If you play the harmonic, sorry, and then play the the, they should be the same pitch. But that also could be a string, couldn't it? It, it can be a string, but it, but if it if it's all out, if if none of them are reasonably, that's 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 pretty good. You have to be very careful about about how you spread the note. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to bend it out. No, if you, it's very easy to bend it one way or the other. I mean, that seems pretty good to me. But, but um, if a guitar is obviously not 
correctly set up in terms of its scale length and compensations and so forth, then that would be very obvious. You'll get something like where I'm purposely pulling it out of tune, or the other way. Tune, you were never going to play that in tune. No, no. So intonation, that's, an, that's really another one to check. I, I think in a way those are the most, the most obvious things. And then of course it's about the sound. So what I normally do is just to play a couple of common chords. <laughs> just to get a sense of the openness of the sound. Is it really closed in and not wanting to give out its sound? Just by doing that gives me a sense of whether there's some richness and bottom end in the bass. Uh, can I hear the treble clear enough? That sounds quite pleasing. So I would do something that checks the, the all-important first string. that you might want to check how you respond to the basses lots of people play you know does that give you a rich shallowy sort of sound you might want to do something that checks the middle strings so you really want to try all over the guitar a big mistake I feel a lot of players make, including quite advanced players, they'll come and try guitars and they'll be flying all over the place at a million miles an hour and frankly you hear nothing doing that. Um, it's more important to play single notes uh, at first and uh, long lasting notes because you can hear the sustaining quality of the note and you can hear how the notes end, not just how they start. What about the evenness and uniformity of the sound? Hmm. We have to remember that our chosen uh, instrument, the classical guitar, is a rather imperfect beast. And the most expensive guitar in the world, if you were to analyse it playing chromatic scales, there will be some notes which will be shorter or longer than others. It's just the nature of uh, an acoustic instrument with fixed a fixed body, fixed dimensions. Um, so long as those things are not severe, that's part of the charm of our instrument. If it's severe, then you could argue that that particular instrument is faulty. Okay. And we need, we need to check playing up and down the strings? For you do, yeah, generally, yeah. <laughs> pretty even really yeah. yeah now what a lot of people do um, and it can be slightly irritating sometimes is if you blank all of the other strings and play just notes on the first string it, it rather artificially uh, exposes more the difference in character between the notes that's a little more jumpy Yes, because part of the natural nature of the guitar is that when you play a note on any string, other parts, other strings, and other parts of the guitar kind of join in. It's part of the character of, of, of our instrument. If you block out the other strings, you're stopping all of that happening and you're exposing that individual string to how long the note lasts. So it's a really efficient way of checking basically. It is, although, some, although you will ne inevitably find more variability in the notes in that chromatic scale than you would find if you just play music. It's, it's slightly artificial okay. and, and it, 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 uh, it exaggerates um, the, the, the strong notes. The other thing of course is what people sometimes call wolf notes, I call them nervous notes really. We talked about tap tones, we talked about air resonances, this guitar 
this guitar which has got a tap tone around G sharp and an air resonance of G, a G and G sharp are always going to be the notes on this instrument slightly more nervous than others, particularly on the fourth string. So for example, see there I can more easily make the G rattly, particularly if I use a rest stroke, because it's responding to the top. Similarly with the F sharp because it's responding to the body. You come down to F and it's more um, How do some guitars have this and some other, and others don't? I think they all have it. Right. Because you can't get away from the fact that every instrument has got a particular tap tone on the top and it's got an air resonance. It's part of the geometry of the guitar. You can't avoid it. Um, and, and every guitar in the world has got some more buzzy notes than others. Right. They, just they looking are. for something that's not too severe. Exactly. Something that's manageable. But if you understand where the tap tones and air resonances are on your own guitar, mm -hmm. when you're playing a scale in a, in a piece, you will know which notes that you just have to back off slightly. Okay. Okay. And um, I've had a lot of guitars in the past where I've really not been very happy with the third string. Hmm. Is that a common thing? Yeah, it is actually. Um, it is. The, there can be quite a difference in character between the, the second string sound and the third string. And then of course when you come to the first of the metal wound strings on basses. Now, um, very often people find themselves settling with a particular make of string. For example, let's, let, let's take the very commonly used Daddario uh, Pro Arte GJ45s. Uh, some people find that the third string in those sets is a bit clunky, a bit thick, a bit heavy. And so it's a very common practice that just the third string only, people will find a different kind of string. Very commonly with the Darios, people will use a Savara's Alliance or Corum third string because it's a bit, a little bit nearer in diameter to the second string, and in tonal balance is gives a better balance to some people's tastes between the second and the fourth. But the guitar itself can somehow. It's not just the string, is it? It's no, that's right. Yeah, that yeah, the third string can be can be a, a a bit tricky, and very often, of course, the open string G is very often near to either the tap tone or the air resonance. So sometimes the open string can be a bit jumpy, or maybe the or in this case the G sharp is is slightly wolfy. But the reason for that is because it's it's responding to the do you think it's a good idea to bring your own instrument along when you're comparing? Because oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. With, absolutely. New, with new strings as well. Yeah, well, with the, or with decent strings, yes, that's right. Because um, when you go to a, a shop or a festival or a guitar maker's workshop, the environment and the acoustic is different from what yeah. you're used to playing in. Because a room can make a huge difference. Oh, make a huge yeah. difference. So, yes, I would always, always recommend that you take your own guitar and play that first so that you know what what you, the sound that you're used to sounds like in the room in which you're going to try other instruments and then you've got a more um a, a, a better a better a better balance a, a better way of of judging how the potential new instrument sounds by comparison with the one that you're used to and for our um, beginner intermediate players just give a very quick um appraisal of uh, spruce versus cedar? If you have two guitars uh, by the same maker or factory, the same model, but the only difference is that one is cedar and one is spruce, we normally think that the cedar guitar has got the richer, more warmer coloured sound by comparison with the spruce which might be described as having a whiter sound, a purer sound possibly. Um, the thing that complicates that is that CD guitars tend to be more ready to go on day one, uh, more ready to go straight out of the box. 
the spruce guitars can tend to be rather sleepy and even for the sake of two or three hours of playing they liven can really up. yes they can as you say they can liven up dramatically and this makes the comparison slightly more confusing for people who are not experienced in it but you shouldn't buy a guitar expecting that one day it's going to mature into something wonderful if it's not to start with because you've got some really young guitars that sound brilliant already yes um you you often can believe that um guitars will improve with uh, with playing and, and with time um but not fundamentally so for example if you play a guitar and it's just got a dead short top e it's always going to have a dead short top e you know, if you think, oh, this is a lovely guitar, I just wish the sustain was a second or two longer, that might come. The other thing that happens is very often new guitars, as well as hearing the musical notes, often there's a little bit more sound of nail and flesh and string in the beginning. Those secondary sounds, for whatever reason with time, that tends to sort of subside. So I think, you, yes, you can believe that instruments will improve, but I, I think you have, to, you have to like it and love, and love it enough on day one so that even if it didn't really change very much, you're still going to be happy. And do these £300 guitars change much? Yes. Even at that level? Yes, yes, because actually many of them have got surprisingly high quality tops, particularly in the cedar. As an aside, I find that uh, below about eight or nine hundred pounds, the vast majority of guitars um, will probably have seed tops. And I think the reason for that is that uh, the cedar, the Canadian cedar, uh, comes from enormous trees uh, in an area which has still got a lot of virgin forests. So when you cut chunks of the tree, it's relatively easy, I could say, for like falling off a log, um, to find boards with consistent grain, knot free, resin pocket free, and so forth. And this is a joy for the guitar maker, particularly in a factory environment, because they can just put the tops through a planing machine to a certain thickness, and they'll all be consistently good. With spruce, it's fundamentally different. They grow, they're much smaller trees for a start off, and they grow on the windy slopes of European hills and mountains. They twist with the wind. So what happens is when you cut a chunk of the tree and split it for boards, you could take half a dozen boards of the same chunk of the same tree and they'll all behave differently. The artisan maker will feel that with each guitar he's going to make. You can't do that in a factory environment. The people don't have the knowledge and skill. And so the spruce guitars at low price, by, from what I experience, are much more hit and miss as to whether they're good or not good. Well, overall, the thing that's most important is that a guitar that you're considering buying makes you smile. It's got to have musicality. It's got to have something about it that makes you want to pick it up and play it. And normally that is when you've got an instrument which gives it sound easily enough, that allows you to find, um, you know, quite easily d different tone colours. You know, uh, flexibility of tone, ease of playing, and a tone world which you find pleasing. Now, of course, that's very much about personal preference. Um, at my age and at the times when I first came to classical guitar, I was listening to many of the players of the past playing what today would be really vintage instruments. Uh, for much younger players, if their first exposure to classical guitar was hearing much younger players playing Australian uh, lattice top guitars, which has a very different kind of sound to it, that will colour your judgment and your preference fundamentally and you know it, it's interesting it's valuable that we all like different things it would be very boring if we all wanted just the same thing
Well, I hope you got something from this video. A very big thank you to Miles for giving us his time. I've put a link to his website in the description below. And please give me a thumbs up if you've enjoyed this. Subscribe. Keep the comments coming and I'll see you in the next short tutorial.